Well, good morning, church. So good to see you. So good to be here. My name is Greg Brazil. I'm the North Campus Pastor. Uh, we hope to launch, yeah, there we go, got one of those. Uh, we hope to launch early next year, so be in prayer for us for that. Uh, let's go to Ephesians chapter 3 if you have your Bible. Uh, Ephesians 3, we're going to uh, stop this series here. We'll begin Wisdom Series next month, uh, but for now, or, or next week, but for now is Ephesians 3. So at some point, all of you, uh, all of us, we are going to suffer. Hope you're encouraged by that this morning as we start the sermon. So all of you are going to, at some point, um, you're going to go through pain, through trials, through uh, suffering, through uh, financial hardship. You're going to face cancer, face death. All of us are going to, at some point, deal with those things. Everyone knows this, okay? All cultures know this. All races, all religions have uh, some paradigm to deal with and view suffering. All of us go through this. Um, and so Christians, we are not exempt from this. God's sons and God's daughters, adopted, loved, uh, chosen, cleansed, redeemed, we still go through suffering. We face pain and, and trials and uh, all these things happen to us. It's going to happen, but it often it just kind of knocks us off balance, doesn't it? Like it, it causes us sometimes to lose heart, to become discouraged, and it's just confusing, quite frankly. And so a few, uh, last month there was a, uh, someone somehow hacked into our savings account. Not their, our checking account, not stolen our card. They hacked into our savings account and spent uh, almost $2,000 at a CVS in Los Angeles. And my first thought was, what is this, like breaking bad? What do they buy at CVS for $2,000 for one? And so the bank calls, they alert us, we go through all this paperwork, all these things, we have to fax in, email in these things, sign this, change the cards, cancel accounts, all this stuff. It was miserable. And my thought during this whole time was, God, you are sovereign over everything. You are sovereign over every CVS, all of cyberspace, all the money in the world, and I am your chosen adopted son. Why did you let this happen? Has it ever happened to you? Like you go, God, I am yours, you are mine, you are the sovereign God over everything, and yet these things still happen to us. So that's everyday suffering. There's also what you may just call gospel suffering, that because you are living and advancing and obeying and making known the gospel, suffering comes in your life. The gospel just attracts suffering, doesn't it? And so you seek to uh, share Christ with your neighbors, your co-workers. You get excluded, mocked, persecuted, uh, even killed uh, in, in some circles. And the, the strongest among us, um, we, we tend to lose heart. So take someone like John the Baptist in the Bible. John the Baptist comes on the scene kind of like Batman. He just kind of shows up like Batman and just begins to yell lots of stuff, wears really strange clothes, has a really weird uh, diet. And everything that he says drips with conviction and passion and assurance that Jesus is the Christ, doesn't he? I mean, everything he says, he says things like, I am not the Christ. I don't look at me, don't look to me. That's the Christ. Behold him. Like, I can't even tie his shoes. I can't, I can't Velcro his toms. Like, I have no place with him. He must increase, I must decrease. So everything that John says just says to us, this man knows who Jesus is. He has all this assurance, all this passion. And then John gets arrested. And you know what he says? He sends word to Jesus by his disciples and says, hey, are you the Christ or is there somebody else? Because I didn't sign up for this. Like this whole you must increase, I must decrease. I didn't think that meant jail for me. The strongest saint who has all this assurance, he paves the way for Jesus, begins to lose heart. And so all of us at some point, we will go through some kind of suffering. And if you have your Bible, look at Ephesians chapter 3, uh, verse 1, at what Paul, uh, what Paul says here. He says, for this reason, this is verse 1, for this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles. The gospel lands Paul in prison. In light of all that Paul just said, that sounds absolutely crazy. Because we just spent 10 weeks here preaching through Ephesians 1 and 2 of how uh, God has loved us, he's called us, he's chosen us, he's adopted us, he has blessed us, he's broken all these dividing walls down that stood between us, raised us up with Christ, poured all this grace on us, given us every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus in the heavenly places, and yet we still suffer. It, it doesn't seem to make sense, does it? But what Paul's going to say here is the gospel is, advances through suffering. 
Suffering cannot undo the gospel. In fact, suffering magnifies the gospel in this life. Now, Paul goes on in verse 13, though, and he says something very, very strange. So we're not skipping uh, 2 through 12, so just be uh, rest assured of that. So verse 13, Paul's going to end this section that we're on today by saying this. So I ask you not to lose heart. Don't get discouraged. Don't let your heart sink over this, over what I am suffering for you. So he's in prison, suffering, proclaiming the gospel. He is in prison because of Jesus and for Jesus' sake. And now he says, don't let your hearts be troubled and be discouraged. Now, how do you do that? Like, how do you watch your friends endure seemingly endless seasons of suffering and pain and watch someone's body be just eaten away by cancer and death sets in, financial hardship? How do you watch someone go through suffering but not lose heart? How do you endure long seasons where the pain has not gone away? The physical pain, the financial pain, whatever, it's not going away. How do you not lose heart in the midst of that? Some of you, you may have already lost heart. Like you, you barely got here this morning because you are so deflated and so demoralized by what you're going through right now. And Paul's word to you is, don't lose heart. Or maybe you're, you're very close. Like the season just will not seem to end. There's no good in sight. And you are just hanging on by a thread right now to the gospel. The message for you is do not lose heart. Now you say, well, how do you do that? Well, I think there are three reasons from uh, this text, at least three reasons, that we should not lose heart uh, during suffering. One is that we're in God's plan. I'll explain that. We are now God's new people, and we have access to God's presence. That's why Paul's going to say, let me, sh let me show you why you should not lose heart. You're in with God's plan. You are now God's people. You have access to his very presence. So let's don't lose heart. Let me unpack those for us, and then we'll uh, go get you to your restaurant of choice. Um, number, number one, you are part of God's plan. You're, you're in. All the nations are in, every tribe, tongue, and nation who has believed in Christ. We are now in with God's plan. Therefore, we don't lose heart. Here's what Paul says in chapter 3, verse 2. We'll go back to verse 2. Uh, Paul's going to talk about his own ministry, which he calls the stewardship of God's grace. Um, so God gave Paul a ministry to proclaim the grace of God. And he says in verse 2, uh, that was given to me for you. So God gave this to Paul for uh, these people and those who would hear Paul's message. Now, verse 3, he says, how the mystery, that's a very important word this morning, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. So God revealed this to Paul. Paul didn't make this stuff up. Uh, this came from God, as I've written briefly. And he says in verse 4, when you read this, when you read Ephesians is what he means here, when you read this letter, you can perceive my insight into the mystery, there's the word again, the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men. And the sons of men is a phrase for God's people. In other generations, as it has now, since Jesus has come in the flesh and dwelt among us, it's now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. So Paul's saying, God gave me this ministry. He revealed this to me um, to preach on this mystery. And the question is, what's the mystery? Well, I'm glad you asked because Paul answers in the next verse. Verse 6, the mystery is that the Gentiles, the non-ethnic uh, racial Jews, are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now, this language here, members, um, uh, fellow heirs, that's Old Testament Israel language. So if you read the Old Testament, uh, God saved one nation. Right? He chose uh, Israel to proclaim his glory to all other nations, but they were his uh, adopted, chosen nation. Okay? Um, now what Paul's saying is, God's saving all the nations. Like God no longer wants one tribe and one nation and one language. He wants all tribes and all nations and all languages. This is the mystery of the gospel. And so what he's saying is don't lose heart because you have now been brought in to God's plan for, for the world. And listen, anyone can get in on this. If you are here doubting, kind of on the fence with Jesus or kind of kicking the tires of Christianity, anyone can get in on this. Like the most skeptical, the ones with the most doubts, 
Jesus can overcome those things. Let me prove that. Verse uh, 7, Paul says this. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. Now, if you read uh, the book of Acts, Paul was the most skeptical critic of Christianity. Like he absolutely despises the church, despises Christianity, wants to stop this. He even goes so far as to approve of the murder of of a a Christian named uh, Stephen, uh, tries to lock up Christians and put them in jail. Paul wants to stop this. So if you have doubts about Jesus, you likely can't touch Paul's doubts. Like he absolutely was opposed to this gospel church idea. Then he sees Jesus. And all those doubts begin to dissolve and he sees the glory of the risen Christ and now Paul is laboring to make this message known. Anyone can get in on this. So we're in God's plan, which means that no amount of suffering, no amount of sorrow and grief and loss and failure, nothing can undo these plans for you in Christ Jesus. And so Paul's saying, don't lose heart over this. Take heart that there is nothing that can now undo this, and and here is why. Verse 8, to me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles, the unclean outsiders we saw from uh, a few sermons ago, to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. Like, you can't Google riches of Christ. You can never exhaust the riches of Jesus. Like Paul's saying, I am making these things known, and to, verse 9, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. So the mystery is that God's bringing us into his plan, bringing the Gentiles, bringing all nations in, but it's happening through a person. Do you realize that no other religion can claim this except for Christianity? Other religions only offer you teachings and a path. So some teacher comes along and says, here is the way, right? You walk in this, um, live these truths out, follow this path. There is truth, now believe that. There is life, now go find that. But Jesus comes along and says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. It's not some teaching or some path or some idea or philosophy, it's a person. The gospel offers you a living person, not just some philosophical idea out there. He offers you a real human being. God in the flesh is who has redeemed us. And that's why you shouldn't lose heart, because you have him. You have him who have these unsearchable riches in Christ, who is enough for you in all of your pain, all of your sorrow, all of your suffering. He is worth suffering for. And he is better than any comfort that this world offers to us. Any pleasure, any riches, any amount of popularity, Jesus is better and greater and worth more. He speaks a better story and gives a better word than any of those things give to us. So don't lose heart because God has brought you into his plan of this man, this God man who has unsearchable riches. So uh, last week we had Lord's Supper at our St. John campus and I was holding the cup as people came by and would dip the bread in the, uh, in the cup and we say to each person, this is Christ's body broken for you. You've heard those words? This is Christ's blood poured out for you, shed, spilled out for you. And it just dawned on me last week, watching literally a thousand or so people come forward and do this, that we could stand here for days and days and days and say that to thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people and it still be true. This is Christ's body broken for you. This is Christ's blood spilled out for you. You cannot tap the riches, the depth of the riches that Jesus offers to us. He is inexhaustible when it comes to his power, his grace, his might, his love for us. So don't lose heart because he is with you, he knows you, you are his, you are in the plan of God through this person. Number two, if you're taking notes, number two is that we're now God's people. So God has brought us through this person. He has made us into this new community. The gospel has bonded us and united us together like nothing else this earth offers to us. And so now we get to suffer together. 
Look what Paul says uh, in verse uh, 10. He says, so that through the church, and the church is the gathered people of God who come together and we are now the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, we are now his on this earth. And he's chosen us, he says in verse 10, um, that, uh, that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known might be put on display, is what Paul is saying here, to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So, so Paul is saying that God's justified, redeemed people, okay, are the ones who now display the glories and wisdom of God to all of creation, which is a glorious thought if you think about it. Like God is using us, God has picked us to make known his glory, to make known his riches, to make known his power to all the cosmic powers on this, on this life that you can see that you can't see, he's chosen us to do that. And so when it comes to suffering, you no longer suffer alone. You have the body of Christ that when suffering hits, you have the body of Christ around you uh, just to walk with you, to weep with you, to suffer with you, to cry with you, to meet your needs, to serve you. You have this now. And he says in verse 11 that this, the church, this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. The church was not plan B for God. It was not some afterthought for God. Like God from eternity has always had the church in mind. And that's the reason you can't stop the church. Do you realize this? History for 2,000 years has proven that you cannot stop the spread of Christianity in this life. It doesn't matter what nation you go to, what, uh, what government, wars, persecution, famine, being fed to lions, martyrdom, suffering, sickness, death, plague, famine. You cannot stop the spread of the gospel. Like, it's impossible. It's like jello. You know, you slap it like my sons do. You slap jello, it just spreads everywhere else. That's how the gospel works. So, persecution actually is how you guarantee church growth. Like, you can't stop God's movement in this because it's God's plan from eternity, is what Paul is saying here. You know, the church is like a roach, it can survive anything, okay? A nuclear blast. That was not in my notes, by the way, so I'm probably going to get an email about, about that one. But you can't stop the church. This is God's purposes, God's plan for us. Um, the gates of hell cannot prevail against this, and so it spreads. The gospel goes forth when suffering comes, which means that together we can endure anything. It does not matter what the suffering that comes our way gospel kind of persecution or just everyday life suffering, we can endure anything together because we don't weep by ourselves anymore. We shouldn't be. So uh, uh, about two weeks ago, I got into my first car wreck. First car wreck in 33 years, so it's a decent record. Um, I, was, I had a meeting, was parked on a, kind of in a neighborhood on a curb, get in the car, look, see no one around me. I make a U-turn, and this lady just hits me right in my door, uh, crushes my door. My windshield light literally flies out from the, in the other direction. I get out. I'm unscathed. Uh, no bruises, no cuts, not, not a scratch on me. But then like all the witnesses who saw this come rushing up to me going, are you okay? Can you hear me? Can you? I'm like, yes, we're no, I can hear you. I can see him. I'm, I'm okay. Uh, the lady who hits me rushes up. I am so sorry. I'm, are you okay? Are you hurt? They call it in. Uh, the sheriff comes up, son, are you okay? Have you vomited yet? I'm like, no, I'm not vomited yet. Why would I vomit over getting in a car wreck? Um, then they have uh, two fire trucks show up. I'm like, 10 guys jump out and go, son, are you okay? Do you want to go to the hospital? And I was like, maybe, maybe I should say yes to this. My wife shows up. She did not ask how I was because she's had three babies. She does not care if I'm in any kind of pain. Um, she does not, has no sympathy for me, but she was at least there. Um, the ambulance pulls up. The EMT guy gets out, checks my blood pressure, looking into my eyes. Are you okay? Can you see? Is your vision blurry? Can you hear me? I'm like, yes, I'm fine. At one point, I thought, this is awesome. Like, I could do this all the I'm like Jack Bauer, just kind of all this attention around me after a long day's work, right? But here's the thing. These random strangers, they cared about me. For about 25 minutes, they were concerned about my safety, right? But none of them checked up on me later. 
No one emailed me. No one called me. No one offered me a ride. No one offered me their vehicle for a few days because mine was basically done with. But, but you know who did? People in this body. They called me. They checked up on me. They offered me rides to work and to other places. One deacon actually gave me his truck for three days because I didn't have a car uh, for a few days as I was trying to, to find one. The body of Christ just does this. That's normal for us. It suffers together. It weeps together. Right? No other place on earth. The gospel has cut through all of our financial status and background um, cuts through race, cuts through class, cuts through all of those things, and it suffers together and unites us like nothing else in this life does. And so my, my, my charge to you is don't abandon the church. Listen, I, I know it's messy. Like, I've been in this thing for a while. I understand the church is filled with broken, messy people. The gospel will get you messy people. All right, if it's by grace, that means you're going to have some busted, broken up people coming in these doors that's just going to happen. So Christ's bride, the church, is still imperfect. All right, listen, Jesus married crazy, okay? Some of you think that you married crazy. Jesus married all of us. He pours out his life for all of us. But, but one day, it will not be imperfect. That he will perfect his bride. We will stand before him spotless and purified and holy and completely redeemed and every single tribe and tongue and nation that has the believers, they will gather together and we will sing one song. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wisdom and blessing and honor and glory and might. For you were slain, Revelation 5 says, and by your blood you ransom people for God from every tribe, language and nation. That's the body of Christ. That's why you don't have to lose heart when you suffer. Because you have us around you. So stay in this and suffer with us. Pour yourself out for each other. Let us shoulder your burdens and help you carry the load. That Whatever it is you're dealing with, let us suffer with you and walk through those things with you so you don't you lose heart uh, in the midst of this. So that's two reasons. Uh, the last one... I think is maybe my favorite of all of these, is that we have access to God's presence. You're in God's plan. You're now God's renewed, uh, redeemed people. And now you have access to the very throne room of God. Like you get God now. Through Jesus Christ, he's brought you in. He has qualified you now to be in God's presence. And so uh, verse 12, Paul says, in whom, he's talking about Jesus, in whom we have boldness, and access with confidence. Some of us approach God like some kind of business partner. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. That's not boldness and confidence. You come into his presence, though you are dirty and messy and you feel guilty, you are still qualified for his presence. And he goes on and says, uh, through our faith in him, through our faith in Christ, that's why you don't lose heart. Because you have God now. Like, Jesus came to give you God. The greatest gift God can give you is God. The greatest prize that God offers to us is himself. And therefore, we should not lose heart. So it's in suffering, it's in our pain that we are suffering. We're bringing all those things to him. Because when it comes to suffering, you've got really two options, the way I see it. You can suffer towards God or away from him. You can either bring everything that's in you, everything that you're feeling, everything that's in your mind, in your heart that's hurting and frustrated, you can bring all of that to him and suffer toward God, or you can just kind of stiff arm God and lean into it and power through it yourself. And so Paul seems to be saying here, you have him. You have the very access to the throne room of God because of Jesus. Jesus has qualified you. So Jesus was cast out on the cross to bring us in. Like he suffered outside the camp, Hebrews said, to bring us inside in the very blessings of God. That's why you can now come, because Christ qualifies you. And so when it comes, you know, when it comes to suffering, you, I think you have access to God's presence more in some sense. Now what do I mean? Well, my sons, they always have me. I have three young boys 
they always have me. Like I am available to them as, as best as in my power. They always have access to me. But if they're hurting, they really have me. Uh, so a couple weeks ago, we were at the pool uh, with my old, two oldest sons. And my, my oldest son, Cross, uh, we had this water gun that I bought for him. And so we get there, and I'm on the, just in a chair there just kind of getting stuff ready. I look up, and this older, much bigger, much more obnoxious other kid, um, it's always the other kids, right? Um, he took my son's uh, water gun. And I'm like, what's the deal with this? And so I let this play out, to possibly use in a sermon one day. I knew it was coming at some point. So I let it play out to see what would happen. And a few minutes later, I look up, and this other kid is shooting my son in the face with his own water gun. And all this rage began to just kind of bubble up in me. I'm like, oh, no, he didn't. Like, I will drown that kid. Like, I will right now, which would be great, right? Pastor drowns child at local swimming pool. I was just jealous for him. Why? Because he's mine. He has access to me. God has united us together in a way that really nothing else can even, even top. So he has access to me. I am so jealous for him because I am for him. God is for you. Some of you think that God is always working against you, playing games with you, playing tricks on you. God is for you if you know him. And so you can come to him with anything. You have access now with boldness, with confidence to run to your heavenly father and bring everything to him. Therefore, you should not lose heart. Um, C.S. Lewis said it like this, one of, my, uh, one of my heroes. He says that the man who has uh, God and everything else so you have God and you have everything else the world can give to you. And everything else um, is, has no more than he who has God only. And what he's saying is with God, you have everything. There is no lack in him. You have all that you need through him. He is enough in all of our suffering. So go to him. Run to your heavenly father that we just sang about, that he is good, he is God. The Psalms say that you are good and you do good. All that God does is good. He works all things for good. He is our good shepherd. So ask him, run to him, and, and don't lose heart. Now, last thing I'll move toward the end here. Verse 13, Paul says, So I ask you not to lose heart over what I'm suffering for you, which is your glory. Now, why does Paul say that? I think he says that because the gospel, suffering cannot undo the gospel. Suffering magnifies the gospel. Like it just puts on display all these glorious truths that Paul is unpacking here. It shows us how near God is, how real God is to us, and it reminds us that, that we are his, and that's how it advances in this life through suffering. Reminds us that we are God's, that we're in his plan, that he is enough for us. We are now his people. It advances the gospel. It can't undo it, though. And so that's why Paul told the Corinthians that we are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. We endure and we do not lose heart. Let me say two things um, kind of as we, we end here. Some of you are suffering deeply right now. I don't know what your pain is, what your trial is, but you came in here shaken because the season is not ending. Maybe, maybe the gospel is costing you something right now. Maybe at your job, with your family, with your friends. The gospel is bringing about suffering in your life. Let me just say to you, do not lose heart. The gospel is enough for you. Jesus is enough for you. Do not lose heart over what you are suffering. Others of you, um, you're not suffering and you ought to be. Like God is pushing you and leading you into very risky places and you're resisting that because it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you maybe your job, your friendship, your popularity. He is pushing you into difficult gospel conversations and situations, and you're resisting that because you know suffering is coming. You know you're going to lose approval, lose friendship. It is coming for you, and you know this. But let me just say to you, don't lose heart. The gospel is big enough to handle all of your suffering. 
It is worth sacrificing and risking and giving up your life for. So may we suffer well, all of us, wherever we are, whatever is happening, may we suffer well uh, and not, not lose heart. Let me pray for us, and then we'll uh, sing our last few songs together. Father, we confess that we, we don't know what to do sometimes. But God, our eyes are on you. God, you are our treasure. Father, you are our king. You, we just said you are good and you do good. God, you brought us into your, your plan. You have made us your people. Father, you have called us to yourself now that we have access. You've broken down all the walls. You've removed all of our shame, all of our guilt, all of our fear. And so we can now with boldness come before you. God, help us to know that. May our hearts understand that you are for us, not against us, that you crushed your son to prove that. Father, I pray for those who are in a season right now of doubt, of fear, God, of confusion. May you, uh, God, just meet them. May they suffer with us. May we run to them. May we weep with those who weep. Father, I pray you would give us all courage. Uh, to be risky for the gospel. God, to step out, to be bold uh, in our faith, to proclaim that Jesus is our king, that he is better, that he is good, uh, and he is worth risking everything for. God, may we just live that this week. Pray you would open doors for us to talk about the glories of the gospel. May you show us, Father, ways that we can magnify your son uh, in the coming days and weeks, we pray. Thank you that you have loved us, that you have called us, that we are yours. May we revel in that truth. Pray in Jesus' great name. Amen.